right, well, this morning we are starting with a session to help you learn a little bit more about a, an individual church's journey toward inclusion. And the church that we are going to be sharing about with you today is called New City Church of Los Angeles. Kevin here, Kevin Ha, is the pastor, <laughs> the lead pastor of New City Church. And Daniel and Michael Rorella are longtime members of New City Church who are also a married couple. And so you'll get to hear kind of from two perspectives about, <laughs> about their process and story. I was, in, you invited me to come speak at New City Church in March of this year. I loved it. I have never been to a church, and Kevin will share more about this, that was as diverse in as many ways as New City Church, and that has done it in such a beautiful way while also very much keeping everything centered and grounded on Jesus. And I just thought that the way they have handled this process has a lot of excellent lessons to teach and to offer to other pastors, other churches that are seeking to move in this direction. I'm sure many of you are parts of churches that you would hope can continue to move in this sort of direction. So that's part of what we want to share with you today is what New City Church has learned, what they've done, and the model that they are able to offer and any insights that they can share. So before we get into the church, though, I just want to introduce you to each of these individuals. So first of all, Kevin, thank you so much for being here today. Can you just tell us a little bit about, before we even get to the church, <coughs> who you are, your background, right? where you were raised, your connection to church and faith growing up? Thanks. Um, just to answer all the curiosities that's running through your mind, <laughs> motorcycle accident, I'm good, my head is good, I'm grateful. We are very great. It was actually quite a harrowing incident just yeah. a few weeks ago, and you like flew off the motorcycle onto a car. Yeah, um, slow motion memory of uh, being um, airborne in the middle of the freeway, but I'm, I'm grateful. Um, so, we are very uh, grateful he was wearing a helmet as well. Yes. <laughs> um, so, I, uh, I'm a Korean American immigrant. Uh, immigrated to the U.S. when I was 10 years old. Grew up in San Jose, California, and my parents were Presbyterians, uh, Korean Presbyterians, which makes them fairly conservative. Um, and, um, and you know, conservative evangelical Presbyterian context is where I grew up. Uh, but I was also influenced by Baptist churches, uh, charismatic churches along the way uh, in, um, in college, at high school and college. Uh, by the time, um, well, it, my life journey is feeling a sense of calling to ministry but not wanting to do it going to law school, becoming a lawyer, moving to LA to practice law, and then feeling again that God is calling. And uh, my wife and I going through a, a journey of discernment and actually leaving law, um, entering into ministry, and being called to plant a church in downtown Los Angeles. Um, so it's uh, quite a journey, but it's been fun. And, oh, and also, uh, if, you could have, if you could put the slide on the screen that shows a picture of Kevin and his family. Um, do you yeah. want to tell them about your family? Yes, so I have, um, my wife is right there, my wife Grace, and uh, I have three children. My eldest child, um, non-binary, uh, bisexual. Um, I'll tell you about them later on. Um, and I have twins, Bennett and Eliana. And so final question here at the beginning. By the time, before we even get to when you started the church, but by that point, what had your experience been with this conversation with gay people? Uh, what were your views at that point? Um, I was always a political liberal. So in that sense, I was always for... Um, in the context of society for um, you know, same-sex marriage, uh, for same-sex equality in many ways. Um, and, and so I was there, and I, I also felt that the church um, 
you know, their focus on these issues, uh, you know, the LGBTQ issue and abortion issue, it's just way off in terms of what we ought to be focusing on in this world. So I had that perspective, but within the context of the church, um, I felt that this was a question of discipleship and, um, you know, uh, maybe the world uh, should be able to decide what it wants, but the church, I was fairly conservative on this issue and side B firmly uh, at the beginning of the church. But I felt very strongly that we should, um, we should be inclusive, loving, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it, but so th that, was, that's, that was where it was. Okay, so the summary then is you were supportive of equal rights. Mm -hmm. In, the, in civil society, but you were not affirming in no. your theology at that point. No, not at that point. You wanted the church to be loving, but not affirming, essentially. Yes. Yes. Okay, so now let's hear from Daniel and Michael. So first, Daniel, can you just tell us a little bit about your background? Sure, so um, I was actually born in uh, New York, uh, raised in Southern California, and it was this really interesting story of how my parents had divorce early, and I basically spent my childhood bouncing back and forth between coasts. I like to say that uh, first, third, and fifth grade, I was in New York. Second, fourth, sixth grade, I was in California, which kind of went on and on until about college, which I didn't split up those years. And on top of that, you know, since I was very young, I always knew that I was attracted to, like, the same gender. Um, but of course, you know, when you're moving back and forth and you're like mildly bullied for being nerdy, you know, that's, <laughs> you don't want to say that, oh yes, and on top of all that, I like boys, you know? <laughs> so it's a thing that you kind of keep your mouth shut about. And I grew up in kind of like a nominal Catholic uh, Filipino American family. But in my late teens, um, I kind of like, well, my mom had like this huge conversion experience and I, <laughs> it was like the whole traditional altar call, like, you know, raise your hand if you want to accept the Lord. And I remember, you know, looking at my mom and I'm like, whatever journey she's about to go on, I should probably go on this too. You know, so I, I like to say that I kind of came into evangelicalism riding on my mom's coattails of her faith. Um, but um, yeah, I've, at that point when I was getting older, I realized that, you know, it's like this whole gay thing isn't going away. And I was terrified and as probably a common story, like, and I trusted nobody with that information. I, the first place that I really came out was to like, strangers on the internet and online forums because that felt safer than coming out to my family or my friends or my church. And with arguing back and forth with these strangers, you know, it was these Christian strangers, a lot of times it would bring up Romans 1. And it was just interesting to me how much, how often they talked about lust. And like, this is, but I feel like we're talking past each other because that's not what I want out of life. And if lust is the only thing that the LGBT community cared about, then why would we care about marriage? And it was just really interesting to see how they would just dodge that question. And eventually the place I came to was as cheesy as it sounds, 1 Corinthians 13, you know, love is patient, love is kind. Also thinking about Galatians 5, the fruits of the spirit. And I basically came to the conclusion that if I can exude 1 Corinthians 13, and if I can really just exude the fruits of the spirit, then I will stop apologizing to the church about that. Thank you, Daniel. Michael, do you want to share your background? Yeah, um, so I grew up in a, a Christian home, um, and it was about in middle school when I'm like, uh-oh, I think I'm attracted to guys, and that was a terrible, uh, scary thought. And I just kept it a secret through high school, through college, but then in college, I had fallen in love with my uh, straight best friend. Um, and it took me a long time just to even realize that. I kept saying, oh, I, I just love him as a friend, but it, it was more than that. Um, but he was straight and he was gonna get married to his fiance, uh, eventually his wife. And uh, it was that event, because I, I had been planning to just be celibate the rest of my life, um, because that's what I thought God wanted of me, uh, unless God was going to change me, but that wasn't happening, because that had been my prayer. And so that was the catalyst where I'm like, I have to really start wrestling with this. Um, I had found GCN, which was the Gay Christian Network that was founded back in um, 
2004-ish. And I read Justin Lee's side A essay, and I read Ron Belgio's side B essay. Um, and if you're not familiar with those terms, uh, side A is an affirming argument. Um, you believe God blesses same-sex relationships, and if you're side B, you believe God does not bless same-sex relationships. And before reading Justin's side A essay, I said to myself, well, this has to be a fluff argument. And then I read it, and I'm like, well, this has something to say. And then I read uh, Ron Belgao's side B essay, and I'm like, well, this has something to say too. And suddenly I went from being side B my entire life to just suddenly not knowing. And that was a terrible place of uncertainty. Terrible. Um, I would have rather just remained side B. Um, so I began a very active process of studying, talking with pastors, um, reading lots of books, reading entire books of the Bible to understand. And um, eventually I, I kind of sat up one day, I'm like, oh my gosh, I think I'm side A now. And I, I said, well, am I, am I gonna date? And I said, no, I don't even really feel the need. Um, I just said, I just need to keep making friends. And my prayer changed. It went from a panicked prayer of God, what is your will? I would need to know it right now, uh, to a more um, confident prayer um, of God, I think I found your will. Um, but if I got this wrong, still steer me back. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of my journey. No, thank you so much. Uh, so now, Kevin, if we can go to when you decided to start New City Church. When was that? Why did you decide to start the church? And tell us some about the founding vision for it. So in 2007, so I had been um, pastoring for about three years at a Korean-American English-speaking church. And... Uh, um, and I had, uh, my job was to be the urban ministries pastor. And one of, the, one of the responsibilities was to minister in Skid Row. Um, we had this parking lot ministry uh, in Skid Row, uh, Sunday afternoon, just really an amazing ministry. Uh, and it is in that context that I felt a sense of call to plant the church in downtown Los Angeles. Um, downtown was a booming town. Um, it was the fastest growing neighborhood in Los Angeles at the time. Um, and uh, the down I used to live in downtown, but the downtown that I knew was pretty much Skid Row in the financial district. But it had become a gentrifying, uh, but not in a displacement kind of way, but there just a lot of things going on in downtown growing. So, uh, there was this vision to plant a multi-ethnic, multi-socioeconomic church where we can bring people in Skid Row together with these new loft dwellers moving into downtown. Well, there's a picture uh, of it. Yeah, so this is a, a, a more recent picture uh, of the church, but it, it's, uh, the vision was to bring them together. It felt like a pipe dream, but we were sure that this was what God was calling us to do. We felt the heart of God, and we were willing to fail. Um, you know, we weren't going to make the decision based on the probability of success, but by the worthiness of the goal. Um, and so um, that's what we pushed to, and uh, so when we first brought some people together, the vision and, and formulated the vision, um, we began to use the word inclusive, inclusive gospel-centered community. Um, and uh, inclusive was an important word uh, because as we studied downtown, as we hung around downtown more and more, prayer walked through downtown, it's very clear that downtown was a very progressive neighborhood. Um, a lot of people were LGBTQ were moving into downtown um, and everybody else was an ally. And so this was an important issue um, to be able to reach people who are LGBTQ. Um, and not only that, um, we also felt like it's got to be centered on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, that, and, and you know, if you've been to New City for a while, everybody knows what that means. We, we, it's Jesus Center. It's center on the incarnation that Jesus came, that he died for us, atonement, 
that he resurrected, that he ascended, and is coming back, restoration. We, saw, we always talk about the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is about the incarnation, the upside-down kingdom, the atonement, the inside-out kingdom, the restoration, the future-back kingdom. So that's what we focused on, and that's what we preach. And at the heart of everything was this idea of grace of Jesus Christ, and that I had come to believe that the power of grace can transform people wherever they are. And so that was the vision. And to create this crazy community of everybody in the neighborhood coming together by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and become radically inclusive. That was the vision. That's a pretty good vision. Thank you. I have to say. Yeah, it, was, uh, it was a pipe dream. <laughs> and then tell me, at the, at the beginning of the church, this is 2007? 2007 was the beginning of the work of the launch, and we launched in 2008. And so at the beginning of the church, how was the church thinking about issues related to LGBTQ? Yeah. So we, during our process of uh, core group development, this is what you do when you kind of plant the church, you gather some people together. God had brought some people who are LGBTQ to us. One, um, was a woman that I would call Jay because I didn't have a chance to talk to her and get her permission. Um, and she, um, she was about 60 years old, 60 something years old when she came. Um, she was the oldest person in our congregate, in our core group. And, um, and one of the things that we started to do when we gathered was to tell our stories with one another. And I think we were about 30, 40 people at the time. And she shared that she was lesbian um, all her life and she shared that story. And she said, this is the first time in my life that I came out at my church. All this time, nobody ever knew. Uh, she hid, but she came out at church. And the church embraced her, loved her, and she loved the church. And, um, and she sort of set the DNA for how we are gonna embrace one another right from the beginning. But like I said, you know, I had this conversation with Jay and um, right at the beginning, she's, you know, I said, I believe in radical inclusivity. I believe in accepting one another, developing relationship with one another, loving one another, but I don't think the scripture is affirming. That's what I said. And um, I, I remember just, uh, you know, a few years ago, just a couple of years ago, I was talking to her again, and I said, you know, Jay, wh why did you stay? You know, we weren't affirming. She said, that was the best I can get at the time. <laughs> so that's who we were at the time. So then, Daniel and Michael, let, tell us about when you first found out about New City Church, what you knew about it, and why you decided to check it out. Yeah, before, before I even met Daniel, um, there was kind of an underground Bible study at New City um, um, by one of the members at New City Church. And it was started in downtown LA as well, and I was invited and I attended for a period of time. And that's how I found out about New City. And it was made very clear to me that uh, Kevin was not affirming, he was side B, but it was still a very welcoming place. Uh, and I attended a couple times, and that was before I met Daniel. It'll take, it'll take over. And so, you know, when Michael and I met, we started, we met in November of 2010. Um, by spring of 2011, uh, we were starting to talk about, oh, is there a church that we can probably go to together? Because we weren't, you know, we weren't living very close to each other at the time. We were both in Southern California, but about an hour away from each other. And um, I had found New City Church's website. And I remember the statement still that was on New City Church's website, which is, this is dating it now. Uh, whether you voted for Obama or McCain, whether you're black or you're white, whether you're gay or you're straight, whether you're this or you're that, we want you to come and experience God's love. And Michael and I looked at that and we were like, well, they didn't say that they affirm same-sex marriage specifically, but because they said gay or you're straight, it does seem like we can come to this church as boyfriends and it won't be some big scandalous thing that we're gonna get kicked out for. And we ended up being right about that, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, we became a part of the community, you know, and, we, and this is also important too, like we didn't come to the church with, you know, some big gay agenda, we just, <laughs> we just felt like, oh, this is a church where we could really 
that we really felt like we could be a part of, right? Yeah, at the time, my criteria to join church was uh, that there were going to be people there my age, that the worship was going to be contemporary, that the sermons were good, mm -hmm. and that me, or, or in this case, us, being gay wasn't going to be a big deal that was going to cause a lot of controversy. And so uh, this New City had all that, and we just wanted to be part of the community. So four years, so it was 2011 yes. that you started attending. Four years later, you get married. So tell us about uh, kind of what that journey looked like, especially as it related to your place in the church community, the responses you received from the church, and how, how that made you feel. I remember, um, like, within six months or nine months, Daniel said he wanted to start doing some small groups together, which we call grow and serve groups. So we did uh, one or two of those. And so we're now integrated into the community more and more by being part of the small groups. And we were also serving on the media team, the nursery, and other capacities as well, too. And so, you know, eventually we, we do become engaged. Um, and the way it was announced at our small group, some were receptive and others were not. Um, some people clapped and others were silent, and that was kind of awkward and a difficult thing. Um, and so the church saw us go from boyfriends to fiancés to eventually becoming married. All right, can we put that picture up? Um, I remember, uh, you know, there was a question, well, who's going to propose to who? And I, I decided it should be me because I was more hesitant. Michael beat me to it. <laughs> I was more hesitant at the start of our relationship, and I thought by, by proposing uh, to Daniel rather than him proposing to me, I'm giving the more active yes, and I wanted him to understand that. And um, uh, Daniel said yes. <laughs> um, so then we got married. And that was a little bit of a process for the people in our community as well, in our church community, because we did choose to invite people from New City Church. And uh, some people were enthusiastically, yes, I will come. Others were much more hesitant. Some said things like, yeah, I'll, I'll come. And they, they would say it verbally, but then they would never RSVP with a clear answer. Um, one person was gracious and invited us to lunch, and Daniel, do you want to share that? Yeah, so like, it, it was really interesting to see the response from our church like all across the board when we first announced our engagement. Um, like Michael said, there were some people who were really enthusiastic, and there were other individuals who basically told us, like, there was one in, uh, individual in particular who sat down with us at lunch and says, like, Daniel, uh, and he said, Daniel and Michael, I've had Christian friends before, I've had gay friends before, you guys are the first gay Christian couple friends that I have, and when I got your wedding invitation, I really just had to wrestle with this issue in ways that I hadn't before. And he, he ultimately decided not to come, but he was gracious enough to actually tell us. It wasn't a pleasant conversation, but at the same time, he wasn't rude about it at all. And of course, you know, it's, it's a wedding invitation. It wasn't a demand. <laughs> so, you know, we accepted that, but it was a thing that, you know, as a gay Christian couple at a church that wasn't affirming at the time, it was a thing that we did have to deal with. Yeah, so that was one of the, even though it was a difficult thing, certainly done more graciously. There was someone else who had given us an enthusiastic yes, I was gonna even help out, and then backed out that same week. Um, and so that was very angering to me and very hurtful to me. And then Kevin, did you have, you were aware that they were getting married? Yeah, I was in my sabbatical at the time. And, um, you know, as I look back now, I'm, I'm very sad that I um, didn't get to officiate because I knew that if I was side A, they would have asked me to officiate. Uh, but, you know, knowing my position, they did not. And, um, um, and, you know, I was in a sabbatical, so I didn't attend the wedding either. Um, and I feel very uh, bad about all of those things. And, 
and not, not just um, Michael and Daniel, but also there were so many conversations with various different people through the journey of the church because our church looks so accepting and loving in so many different ways and so diverse. We're about evenly spread out in four major ethnic groups. About a, a third of us come from uh, Skid Row, the other two thirds from more middle class or from middle class. So it's a, it's a radically diverse community that we're very proud of, uh, yet um, there was this thing, and um, people who are LGBTQ often would make appointments with me to kind of ask me about what our policies were, what, what we thought, and um, so I, you know, I would tell them that I'm not affirming, but we're radically inclusive, um, and and then we would have some conversations. Sometimes it would be very sad uh, ending where they loved the church, but they felt like they couldn't continue on. I had one episode in which um, uh, we hired a youth pastor, um, an amazing guy, very gifted. I was so excited about the hire. He was affirming. We had staff who were affirming. You know, we had people, in, with respect to where they were in this issue, you know, people were all over the place in our church. And, um, and he thought our church was affirming and I was affirming. Um, so, but when he found out after he received the offer that I was not, he decided not to join and left the church instead. And it, it, and it was very painful to him and his family and to me at the same time, and I realized that our sort of opaqueness in our policy um, had to be clarified. So you, you can't just have a church that feels so inclusive, yet not be inclusive. That's, that's cheating. And, and they had some conversations with Michael and Daniel, deep conversations about this issue. Well, yeah, can um, we have uh, Michael and Daniel explain a little bit? Because I think they were, you were realizing, Kevin, we need to clarify this mm -hmm. opaqueness. Mm -hmm. And then Michael and Daniel, you were kind of thinking similar questions, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it was, it was really interesting, because when we first joined the church, we had, like, you know, like, straight allies who were, or straight friends who were just kind of, like, nudging us, like, hey, Michael and Daniel, you should talk to Kevin about... You know, they, it's funny because they never really finished that sentence, but we kind of knew what they were kind of getting at. Um, and, at and at the time, we were like, well, yeah, but, you know, we don't want to feel like lobbyists at New City Church. And, like, we hadn't really had, like, a deep conversation with Kevin and Grace yet, and we didn't want our first conversation to be like, oh, okay, let's talk about gay stuff, you know? Uh, <laughs> but there was something that happened in 2016 that I'll let you, Michael, talk about that kind of lit a fire under us and was like, okay, no, we really should start talking about this. Yeah, um, so when I was in college, I went through InterVarsity, um, the college campus group, and it was an organization that I, I loved very much. I found them to be a very thoughtful, Christ-centered organization that thought very deeply about um, racial tensions and women in ministry, and they approached that with such grace, and I, I appreciated that so much. Um, but what happened in October of 2016 is an article came out uh, saying that InterVarsity Christian Fellowship was asking all their affirming people, all their affirming staff people to leave. Um, and that uh, caused a lot of pain in me and caused a big uproar um, in many places uh, in the US. Um, and so what I began to think was like, wait, if if InterVarsity can do this, which is a very thoughtful uh, Christian organization, how it, could this happen at New City Church as well? And, and suddenly I began to realize we have to start a conversation here. We need to start talking with Kevin. We need to start talking with New City because I would hate for this to happen at New City Church. No, that's great. And so do you want, want to share, well, we'll put on the screen a timeline if you just want to see kind of everything we've discussed about where we started in 2008 with the launch of New City Church, Michael and Daniel starting attending in 2011, getting married in 2015, and then you decide 
to get dinner with Kevin and his wife, Grace. So would you like to share about how that went? We wanted to start this conversation very slowly, yeah. <laughs> very gently. And so, uh, you know, we were intentional. So we, we invited Kevin and Grace uh, to dinner. Uh, we went out to a restaurant. And, um, you know, we were just getting to know each other. That was it. We didn't, we didn't even talk about um, anything about deep theology. We weren't trying to go into any, any um, angle of like trying to change or push. That was not, not the angle at all. But in 2017, we, we did have lunch with Kevin. And um, we, we came to that one with a little bit more like, with curiosity and questions. And so we had heard uh, different stories throughout the years for um, glass ceilings for us and the like. And we're like, we, we start to ask these questions. Um, what someone had said to us, Dan, um, Daniel and myself, like, you two can't be small group leaders. And, you know, we, we asked Kevin about that um, more concretely to hear it from him. And he, he said, yes, because you are both side A, gay and married. Um, and we asked many other questions. And we want to inquire, like, how Kevin at that point had, had done a lot of study. So, Kevin, do you want to share? Yeah. So, this came uh, around the same time as the youth pastor. Um, and so, and they knew about that as well. And so, we had conversations about that, me, you know, feeling more and more that we need to clarify. And around, from about 2013 to 2017, I was engaged in a lot of studies, re-examination of um, the issue, just kind of digging into the clobber passages. I had resolved all of them except Romans. I, 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 was, I had a really hard time resolving the Romans one passage. Um, and so I, I was still in process reading books, um, uh, and meeting with Michael and Daniel um, and, and, and discussing these things. And, and there were others that I met with at the time as well. I think our church was about, at that time maybe about 5 to 10 percent LGBTQ. Um, and so I felt more and more that we need to talk about this. And, and um, I, th I think the, the biggest part of the change came not from my research, my reading, my exegetical studies, but from getting to know Michael and Daniel, getting to know other um, people who are gay Christians, who are trans Christians, and seeing the fruit of the Spirit, seeing the good fruit bear in their lives, and seeing love. And I think the most demonstrative was Michael and Daniel because they were so gracious, even though, you know, I hurt them. Uh, even though, you know, I, I was, you know, I was not quite there. Uh, but they were so gracious and they stayed and they conversed with me. But they were not, you know, they were direct as well. <laughs> <laughs> about what they thought. They told me exactly what they thought, but they also told me what they loved uh, about the community. And so we felt the sense that we're, gonna, we're struggling together, and I really wanted to do this together with them, go through a process with them as well. Well, so at this point then, there's a mutual desire to have more clarity mm -hmm. around the church's approach and policies. And so in 2018, the church kicks off its first kind of official conversation on the topic. Yes, so, you know, I talked to the leadership team, our um, prior iteration of elders, basically elders, uh, and the staff. So there are about, maybe about a dozen of us all together. And um, we felt that we all agreed that we need to study we need to engage in a conversation and go do a deep dive on this subject together. But we all felt like you can't do a deep dive on LGBTQ subject without someone who's a LGBTQ in the dive. Um, you know, you can't talk about 
you know, women with a bunch of guys around the table. Um, so it's in the same way, so we felt like, uh, so I, you know, I invited uh, Michael and Daniel to be a part of the study group with the leadership team members and the staff. And we went on this journey for about um, eight-ish months uh, of study. So we basically read, um, at the time, Justin Lee's book, Torn, together, and then we would read a little bit, discuss it, a little bit, discuss it. Uh, we, um, we also read Ed Shaw's book, uh, A Plausibility of a Celibate Life. Uh, um, there's another title to the book. Same-sex attraction in the church. Yes, same-sex attraction in the church. And so that was the side B uh, book. And we also read um, The Great Debate between Justin Lee and Ram Balgao uh, and kind of studied that debate. Uh, we also read Ken Wilson's book, Letter to My Congregation, which was a third-way proposal to this issue. And so... Um, yeah, I, I think it was a productive conversation. And, uh, and I, I think having Michael and Daniel there also helped to bring this issue to um, clarity in, in, um, at, at a lot of point when we were lost, I think. So. And so what was your all's experience of that first church-wide kind of official conversation? It was really refreshing, to, and so it was this, also... Oh, guys, that one wasn't church-wide. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, right. This, yeah. just to be clear, leadership. this is 2018, and yeah. it was not yet church-wide. This is just among leadership at this... Um, and us. Mm -hmm. and yes, it, with Daniel and myself invited. Yeah, yeah. So it was just between, yeah, Kevin, the church leadership, and us. So it was fairly small. Um, although, you know, and as small as it was, it was very refreshing that the top-level leadership at New City wanted to have this conversation and include us as well. Um, so that was good, um, and it was, it, it was funny because having read Justin Lee's Torn and like The Great Debate and um, these other books, like, which kind of like for Michael and myself, we'd already been reading books like this for quite a few years now, but it was kind of interesting to kind of start having this conversation finally with our home church. Um, but, uh, and then, of course, that eventually led to yes. the policy change. So right? at the end of that discussion... Um so the leaders, just the elders, not the staff, just the elders, um, began to have discussions about policy and where we want to go and clarity. And um, so there were three issues we were grappling with um, in terms of policy. But we were all clear that we wanted to be a third way church, um, meaning that uh, we all agree that this is not a salvation issue. We are all saved by grace and what Jesus has done for us on the cross, period. So, but this was a discipleship issue. And we also felt that this was a disputable issue under Romans 14. And so that our call is to love one another and to embrace one another in unity, even if we disagree, and we should allow people in the church to disagree. But you can't have two different policies. You can only have one policy. And so with respect to membership, we said, no question. We were already there. Uh, so no prohibition on membership. Uh, with respect to uh, leadership, um, we said, OK, no more glass ceiling. So we are fully inclusive all the way to staff level. And, uh, and then, but with respect to officiation of same-sex weddings, we got stuck at the elder level. Because our church, from the elders' point of view, was about 50-50, side A and side B. We've, they've, um, and and the, the elder board was about 50-50 as well. And I was like right in the middle. You know, like I was side B, but maybe side A, but not quite side A, but still side B um, and, um, at that time. And we made the mistake of splitting the baby. We said, okay, fully inclusive, no, no, um, uh, no glass ceiling, but no officiation. 
of same-sex wedding. And so, like uh, splitting the baby, you know, they die, it doesn't work, you know. Um, Hopefully no one knows that from personal experience. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah. So I remember, yeah. Kevin, when we met in 2019, you were explaining to me, this is our church's policy. And I said, well, I'm not, that doesn't really make sense to me. Didn't make sense. <laughs> Why could you be in leadership positions but not be able to officiate weddings? And I think, Daniel, you had a similar sense of yeah. it didn't quite add up. Yes. So when it was told to us, hey, this is what the policy is going to be, because Michael and I, you know, we didn't write that policy, obviously. Um, but Kevin, you had told us this is what the elders and the leadership have decided. Well, at that point, I started having like one-on-one -on -one conversations with the elders and everyone who was involved in making that decision. And I said, look, here's how it's probably going to play out. And this is like, you're saying that just hypothetically, I'm not saying I want to become a pastor at New City, but let's just say you wanted me to be. Someone was nice enough to officiate my and Michael's wedding. So you're saying that if I became a leader at New City, uh, I, as a married gay Christian man, would have to turn another gay Christian couple away if they approached me and said, Daniel, can you please marry us? And so I was asking, like, well, what married gay Christian would want, what gay Christian would want that? So, and, and I wasn't saying like, okay, I'm not saying that you have to change this policy immediately, but I just want to set expectations and let you know that with this policy, it's not like the floodgates are going to open and LGBT people are going to be tripping over themselves <laughs> to, to want to become leaders at New City Church, you know? So I wanted to plant that seed there for the time being. And eventually that did lead to like another conversation. Yeah. So... The way we released the policy was that after, I gave a sermon on Third Way, and then afterwards we had a church, kind of a town hall meeting. It was like everybody came. It was hot, you know, in, a, in, this, in this room, and, and um, it, the energy was high. It was pretty intense because we hadn't actually released the policy until after the, uh, until we got to the meeting. And, 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 and then we kind of explained the policy. You know, we wrote up like an eight-pager uh, to explain um, what a third way is, side A, side B, um, why this is a disputable issue, but why we can only have one policy. And then, and then as we went through, uh, there was a, a lot of grumbling uh, in a church uh, from both um, the side beers and side airs, although side beers at that point were more silent uh, than side airs. Well, and just to remind people, Michael said this at the beginning, but if you're not familiar with that terminology, yeah. side A is a term that affirming. is used by many to represent the affirming position, mm -hmm. and side B is often used to represent a position that does not affirm mm -hmm. same sex relationships. Yeah. But we all agree that we need to embrace and love but it's just the position's different. And so, um, and someone asked uh, me a question at the time, and I need to go back slightly to tell this story. Okay. Um, so in 2017, right before uh, the, uh, this conversation was going on, my child came out as, my eldest came out as bisexual. And, um, it was a surprise to us. Uh, at the same time that um, they came out, um, at that time, it was a she, uh, but now it's a they, so I'll use the they pronoun. And they, um, they also struggle with um, chest pain. And we were trying to figure out where that came from, and it was, uh, they couldn't go to, school, it was pretty severe. And so instead of focusing on them coming out, we focused on the chest pain for a while. Uh, but at the same time, we told them how we love her, no matter what, unconditionally, we accept her. Uh, but I didn't tell them that I affirmed her. Uh, and that, and, but Grace, my wife, you know, her, her philosophy was, I don't care. I'm going to default on love. 
if God has problems with this, I'll deal with it in heaven. Or, yeah. And, yeah. And, uh, and so she affirmed my child immediately. But I, um, I've had many conversations, but I would, uh, you know, we, we went to some conferences together, Christian um, LGBTQ conferences, uh, and um, really wanted them not to lose faith during this process because I was so worried because they were asking so many questions of faith as well. And, um, and I asked them to just kind of be patient with me because I have to go through a process with the church. I can't just flip. And so, you know, it was, they were very impatient, um, and, you know, understandably so, and hurt by that. But I had to go on a journey. And so that's where the journey, um, you know, that, that, that was another impetus for the 2018 um, kind of church discussion. But at the same time, um, I was proud of what we did. And I wanted to share with them. And so come to church, because they stopped coming to church. Uh, come to church this Sunday, you know. Um, she thought the sermon was okay. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, the, the statement, uh, when it came out, and someone in that room, someone asked the question, so if your daughter wanted you to officiate her wedding, would you not? And my child is right there. And I, I said, no, I would not. And I destroyed my, my child's faith at that point. <laughs> she, she, they were so angry with me afterwards. And um, anyway, that was how we went. <laughs> Well, we're not going to end there, um, because I remember also when we met in 2019, and thank you for sharing that, um, that you told me, you said, well, I'm kind of just right on the edge of side B. And it was later on that year that you did fully change yeah. your mind yeah. and position, which was pretty significant for yeah. what was going to happen with the church. So do you want to just speak to that briefly? Yeah, part of it was reading your book and just this argument on Romans and the context. Uh, that, and, and I'm you know, just kind of going deeper and deeper. But clarity of your argument was helpful because I think I hadn't read anything as clear as what you wrote in God and Gay Christian. Well, thank um, you. Yeah, so... <laughs> On, on the, um, yeah, on all the arguments, but particularly in the Romans 1 argument. Uh, and so that was helpful. And I wanted to be affirming, you know. It's just I needed to make sure that I align myself with the scripture um, because it wasn't really just I want to be affirming so I don't care what the scripture says. I'm going to, I don't like Paul, you know. That wasn't me. You know, that's not uh, what you're saying, yeah. to be clear. <laughs> that's not what I, that, that, that's, that, that's not who I wanted to be. I needed to struggle. I needed to wrestle with God. And, and now it seems so much clearer as I pass, but I don't even know exactly when I became affirming, but sometime in 2019. Um, and, um, and then so after, uh, you know, a year or so, uh, the... Big split didn't happen in a church. And we lost people on both sides, both side A and side B, because we didn't go far enough, you went too far. And so we did have impact in number of people coming to our church, church dropouts, all those really heavy, sad conversations where they tell me how much they love the church, but they're leaving because of this. And, um, but we've, uh, the elder board felt like we need to revisit this conversation. Um, so we decided to do a second round, but we're, we decided to invite the whole church into the conversation now. Uh, so uh, we had this thing called a journey into an uh, LGBTQ conversation, and we invited the whole church. 
uh, into it. Uh, Michael and Daniel were small group leaders in that discussion. It was, it was a lot of people involved in this. Um, and then COVID hit, and so it kind of shrinked a little bit. But uh, we did finish the discussion over like six, seven month period of time. Yeah, if you want to put the slide back up so they can see where we're at on the timeline here, yeah. that's 2020. Yeah. yeah, that happened in 2020. And yeah, it was, it was finally like, you know, we're involving the rest of the congregation in this conversation. Um, and well, it was really interesting because we're navigating that right as the pandemic is beginning. So we were initially going to, it was initially going to be in person, then it goes virtual on Zoom. And and of course, you know, just being on Zoom like that is a new experience for a lot of people. And to boot, it's a very sensitive subject. So at first, there, were, there was a lot of hesitation for people to like want to really be forthcoming with their opinions about the subject matter that we were discussing. But um, it was definitely a, a good step forward. And it did eventually lead to the second policy change, mm -hmm. which was simply that like the one thing that New City would not do for LGBT people was marriage officiation. Mm -hmm. And then, right, Kevin, it mm -hmm. became, well, now it's up to the conscience of the pastor, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. So in terms of the second um, discussion, um, so we, again, read both sides. And we felt that it was important to present both sides because we noticed that if you just present one side, the side you want the church to go to, and they're on the other side, they always say, oh, I have to study the other side before I make the decision. But if we present both sides, people actually have the ammunition or resources to be able to make the decision. So we, on, the, on the second round, we studied um, Matthew's book, uh, God and the Gay Christian. We studied Preston Sprinkle's book for Side B, uh, People to Be Loved. We studied Ken Wilson once again. So those are the three books that we dove into. And um, uh, it, was, it was very productive. Uh, I think the people in the church really got an opportunity to dive into this subject. Um, Cause I, I, you know, I, I now realize that people are Side B, unless they do the study, they can't get to Side A. Uh, if they hold on to the scripture as their authority. And so if they have that, you have to do the study. And so, um, and so we did come to a very simple decision. Let's just leave it up to the conscience of the pastors. Well, and now the conscience of the lead pastor had changed. Yes. <laughs> yeah. and so that's pretty my, significant. Yes, yes. And, and our pastoral staff was not all affirming. Most of us were. But we said it's okay to not officiate if that's your conscience because we're a third way church. And so the way we saw it was if, if you can kind of imagine four different kind of dot in a spectrum, the first dot being like really, um, really conservative, you know, you're going to hell uh, if you're LGBTQ, uh, conversion therapy, we, 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 we called it uh, side X, you know. <laughs> And so we, we, right from the beginning, we reject side X. It's not biblical, it's not gospel, um, it's off. Um, and then, if you can imagine, um, second, uh, which is side B, second dot, which is like, um, I'm struggling with this, I, I wanna converse with why you are affirming, but this is what I'm, this is what I see in the scripture. And so they're open, but they're still side B. And then if you can imagine the third dot, which is you're affirming, but you're still open to a conversation with uh, people who are not affirming. You're open to doing community with people who are not affirming, but you are affirming and you, um, and so, but there's kind of an openness between two and three. And then if you can imagine um, the fourth dot is, um, no, I only want to do community with people who are affirming because people are not are hurtful to me. And I completely understand that, given how the church has hurt people. But in terms of our church, we wanted to create a community around two and three, because um, that's where we're going to be. We're going to give voice to four, but we're not going to give voice to one. And so, but our, our, our place will be around two, or th two and three. And so that's what we call third way church. But our policy is affirming now. Just trying to have that posture of mm -hmm. grace and welcome, regardless of people's beliefs, but with yeah. an affirming policy. Yes. So then we've got about five minutes left, so mm -hmm. I want to make sure we, we get to the final points here. Mm -hmm. um, one is that earlier this year, you all decided to have a follow-up 
conversation focused on the Bible and same-sex marriage. Could, can you speak to the reasons for that and how that went? Yeah, Kevin came to us uh, late 2022 saying, let's do another conversation. <laughs> and um, uh, Daniel and I agreed to do that. And Kevin left it up uh, very much to us for how it would be arranged and organized. And so one of the, the first questions for us was, um, are we gonna do both side A and side B materials? And we had known, Matthew, that you created the video series, the Masterclass for the Affirming Argument. Amazing resource. Oh, thank you. Us. And as we thought about it, and we debated it a lot, we're like, you know what, yes, we're going to do uh, side A and CB, side B materials together. Um, if we approach this as truth seeking, it makes a lot of sense to, to review the materials side by side. So we were looking around and we found out that um, uh, Preston Sprinkle had a video series, a side B one, uh, called Truth and Grace. Grace and Truth. Uh, <laughs> Grace and Truth. <laughs> Is it Michael and Daniel or Daniel and Michael? <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. Depends on the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so we took a lot of the lessons um, that we learned from the 2020 conversation for how we wanted to improve the conversation. Mm -hmm. And one of those was, if you're having a long conversation over five months or eight months or things like that, people for, forget for these complicated arguments for what's going on. So uh, especially if you read like one whole book and then read uh, from one perspective and then read another book from a whole another perspective, it's like, wait, what did the other author say? Especially if two or three months has passed. So we, what we wanted to do was take uh, Matthew Vine's video series and Preston Sprinkles and then interleave them to get those materials talking to each other a little bit better. Um, so that's one of the things we did. We also broke out our groups into four different small groups with different table leaders to guide those conversations. Um, we worked very hard to, after choosing the content, we worked very hard on our approach. We developed the discussion guide to set the right tone. That discussion guide had to, here are the objectives for the conversation so people don't forget what we're, what we're all about. And we put a lot of vocabulary in there so people would understand the vocabulary that was being used. Um, and just a lot of things for just how to have a healthy dialogue, including like, be curious. You know, maybe if you notice that you're feeling angry or maybe you're feeling fearful, you know, inspect that a little bit. If you're feeling really angry, perhaps take a step back. Don't lend your voice to the conversation right at that moment. But if you're feeling fearful, maybe move to a position of just asking more questions. So we put that into our discussion dialogue, and we've reviewed that a lot, for, especially in the first three weeks of our conversation, and to keep it relational. In our fourth week, we kind of took a week off, if you will, where we weren't doing all the, the homework for this conversation. It was just a uh, unstructured lunch, just with your table group, get together and just get lunch. Um, for this conversation, we asked everyone where they currently were on a spectrum between side A and side B. Yeah. And that was done with great intention so that when we form the table groups, we can form the table groups in a way that we put side A and side B people or people in the middle all together in those table groups. Yeah, and also people who were like who we, like, people who were LGBTQ, people who were not, that that's too. another thing too, because we yeah. wanted to make sure that when we break everyone out into table groups, whatever it is that your opinion is, you are gonna speak to someone, you're gonna express it in front of someone who will not share the same opinion as you. And if you have, if you're straight and you have certain opinions about LGBTQ people, there is someone who is LGBTQ in your group. And so I think that is like a good buffer to kind of make sure that people stay respectful and civil about the whole thing. Yeah, and then, all right, second to last question, and then we'll bring it to a close. Uh, one of the things that I have been particularly grateful for and struck by in your church's process is the fact that you were able to navigate this in a way that only solidified the church's theological identity, the church's commitment to orthodox Christian theological beliefs, what you were talking about with those four points of incarnation, mm -hmm. atonement, resurrection and restoration. Any big picture thoughts on how you've been able to do that? Because sometimes 
when there's a big change like this, it can create a lot of volatility and sometimes then even unexpectedly churches see other aspects of their theological identity uh, affected in negative ways. So how have you been able to maintain that core theological commitment of the church? I think right from the get-go, uh, everything that I preach uh, was Christocentric. You know, we believe in a Jesus-looking God. We believe in his incarnation, his atonement, and the resurrection, and the return, and the restoration of the world. And what this means is at the heart of everything. And the scripture is reliable evidence of what God has done in Christ. And so, um, we, that's, we lay that ground for every issue, all the justice issue that we were dealing with, all of the life issues, all. So because we look through that lens, and I think for 15 years I taught people how to look through the lens of Jesus. Um, I think it, when we came to this, we also said we need to look through the lens of Jesus. And so I think that foundation was laid and that was helpful. And so, and there was no way we were gonna sacrifice orthodoxy in any way, the credo, creeds of Jesus Christ in any way to get to something, anything. And this was one of those things. And then final question for everybody, and I'll start with Kevin here, is any advice for other pastors, in your case, and then in, for Michael and Daniel, for other gay Christians, just based on your experience? I would say, um, do the right thing. It's hard. Um, when I moved from non-affirming to affirming, I lost a lot of relationships in the evangelical side. I was on these boards, and um, I was effectively kicked off the board. Um, I was working with people and on this leadership, that leadership issue, I was transitioned off. Um, and uh, that's okay, because we got to do the right thing. But it takes a certain amount of guts. Some, you know, we, we, we're afraid of uh, the financial impact, you know, because that's real, because sometimes that means you got to lay off staff. What does that mean? We're afraid of um, people leaving the church. Um, that's real. And, but somewhere along the line, my philosophy has become do everything possible to retain them, love them, hug them, uh, do everything possible to lessen the negative impact of doing this, but you got to do it because it's the right thing to do because it's not about growth. It's about what the kingdom of God looks like. And it's about building a church where for me, my child can come back to. Thank you, Kevin. And then Daniel and Michael, any advice for other gay Christians? Yes, um, so one thing is, um, at least if you're, you know, if, if you're a gay uh, LGBTQ Christian coming to a church and maybe the church builds itself as inclusive, I think it's really important to, if you're going to ask questions of the staff and the leadership, be really specific about what inclusivity means to you, because what inclusivity means to you and what inclusivity means to the church leadership might look like very different things. So then that would be, you know, you can ask them, it's like, you know, marriage officiation, baby dedication, uh, marital counseling. Um, baptism, you know, uh, all of these different things. It's like, you know, what exactly do you mean practically when you say inclusivity? And then if you're a gay, uh, an LGBTQ Christian who wants to kind of bring your church forward into a path of greater inclusion and affirmation, I think it's really important to really closely evaluate where your church currently is and if you think that they're ready or if they need more time, or if they need, if you just need to kind of organically become a part of the community for a few years before you can have the conversation. And also look at yourself too, and really seriously ask yourself, do you have the bandwidth to do this work? Because it is a lot of work that you should not underestimate how much work it takes. Um, perhaps some things I might share for advice um, is that, like we didn't, we didn't know it <laughs> when we came to New City, but just being part of the community and not, 
being like activists or lobbyists for just five years just built up a lot of trust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just being part of the community, just showing up and wanting to participate. Um, the second thing is like, if you do want to have this conversation at your church, um, be clear with yourself what your objectives are and know how to articulate that um, well. One of the ways I articulated it was, um, you know, if you're, if you're Christian, you, you believe that um, the greatest commandment is twofold, uh, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Perhaps it's worthwhile also asking, how do I love my LGBTQ neighbor really well? How do I do that? And have you studied that before? Have you thought about that before? Another way we thought about inviting people to the conversation was saying, let's maybe lament together over the polarized state of our, our country, our nation. And I think no one feels really good about that. And how sad it is that no one's really talking to each other. Shouldn't church be the place where we have deeper conversations over shared values together, recognizing that, yeah, scripture is difficult to interpret. So let's, let's do that together. All right, well, thank you. So can we just give it up for Kevin, Daniel, and Michael? Thank you so much you. for sharing your story and the example of your church and of you both as a married gay Christian couple. Thank you. Thank you.